Thank you, Seth. That is a uh, very appropriate passage for our text this morning, which is John 18, verses 28 through 40. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. To fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this in your own on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish that I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Let me conclude with a verse that Alan read this morning in Sunday school, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been crucified. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. You never know what you're going to uh, wake up to each morning. Usually it's the same old routine. That's what we expect. But sometimes it's the unexpected. Benjamin Disraeli, Queen Victoria's favorite prime minister, said... What we anticipate seldom occurs. What we least expect generally happens. I don't know that it generally happens, but it does happen. We've all had a routine day turn into a crisis. Pontius Pilate did. He woke up one morning to begin a normal day when unexpectedly the king of the Jews was in his court. Suddenly, he faced the greatest decision of his life, and he was unprepared for it. His wife sent a message to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man. But he was like a man caught in the undertow. He, he wasn't strong enough to overcome the, the forces swirling around him or rise above his own indecisiveness. This is the Lord's second trial. He had a religious trial in a Jewish court. Here he has a civil trial in a Roman court. Most of what is known of the Roman trial is found here in John's Gospel. 
He's the only one to give the account of Pilate's private interview with Jesus. John recorded little about the Jewish trial, uh, a sketchy account of the Lord's interrogation by Annas, and nothing about the trial before Caiaphas. We know from the other Gospels that the Sanhedrin, the high court of the Jews, condemned Jesus for blasphemy when he acknowledged that he is the Christ, the Son of God. Caiaphas tore his robes and said, he has blasphemed, and he called for a verdict. And the court answered, he deserves death. But the Jews didn't have the authority to put him to death, not at least in the way they wanted to. Only Rome had that authority. So to get that, John wrote in verse 28, they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium which is the residence of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Pilate's life was recorded in secular history as well as scripture. The Roman historian Tacitus wrote of him, as did the Jewish writers Josephus and Philo. He was from Spain. He fought with the Roman legions in Germany. Then he went to Rome to make his fortune. There he married a woman of nobility. We even know her name, Claudia Procula. He married up because that connection helped him gain the post of governor of Judea in the year A.D. 26. The historians describe him as morally weak, reckless and cruel. That's how he governed harshly and with very little care for or sensitivity toward the Jews and their religious scruples. Still, they came to him for help in carrying out their plot. They arrived early in the morning because Roman officials began work at dawn and finished as early as possible. So sometime between 6 and 7 a.m., they arrived at Pilate's headquarters. John tells us that they wouldn't enter so that they would not defi be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Now that raises a question about when the Lord and his disciples ate the Passover meal. Did they actually eat it the day before Passover? That's been suggested, and that is possible, but... All of the gospel accounts state that the Last Supper occurred the day that the Passover lamb was sacrificed and that it was eaten on the day of the Passover. So a, a better explanation is that the reference here to the Passover is actually a reference to the combination of the Passover with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which followed the very next day. So there was no gap between them. Luke, in chapter 22, verse 1 of his gospel, states, Now the feast of unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching. They were two feasts celebrated together as one continuous feast. This reference then to eating the Passover refers not to the Passover meal itself, but to the feast of unleavened bread which continued for the rest of the week and was considered the entire Passover festival. The Jewish leaders believed that if they entered the home of a pagan, they would become unclean and unfit to participate in the rest of the celebration. So they remained outside. The, the irony and the hypocrisy of all this is impossible to miss. They were so careful to avoid ritual contamination while at the same time acquiring infinitely greater moral defilement by committing judicial, ju judicial murder. I think Dr. Johnson said that it was the supreme example of straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel and it is. But the irony goes even deeper. These men of the law, 
who were so concerned about eating the Passover were ignorant that the one that they were killing was the true Passover. But they were determined to do it. And to get it done, they forced Pilate to come out to them. When he did and saw that they had a prisoner, he asked, what accusation do you bring against this man? The, the question seems to have taken the Jewish leaders by surprise. They, they had expected Pilate to endorse their verdict without question. So his question put them on the spot. They knew that no Roman would condemn a man because of blasphemy. And by asking for the charge against Jesus, Pilate was opening the case for a formal hearing. So in, in a moment, they would change the charge to high treason, arguing that Jesus claimed to be a king, which made him a rival to Caesar and therefore a threat to the state and political order, political stability. But first they tried to evade the question by answering in a generality. They said, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. The implication was that Pilate should trust them. They wouldn't hand over anyone to him who wasn't guilty, and they expected him to carry out the execution they were seeking. Well, Pilate wasn't their pawn. And if no crime had been committed against the Roman state, he didn't want to be involved. The Jews had their own courts. And so he answered them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said, We're not permitted to put anyone to death. Now that statement was an admission of their intention. They had not come to Pilate for a trial and justice, but for the purpose of having their prisoner, Christ, executed because they didn't have the authority to do it. Now, there is evidence that there was one exception to that, that the Jews were allowed to execute people who violated the temple. Their method of execution was stoning. Acts chapter 7 is the account of Stephen's stoning, though that was probably a case of, of mob violence and the authorities simply overlooked it. But Caiaphas didn't want Jesus stoned. He wanted Jesus legally condemned and executed in such a way that he would be publicly disgraced. And crucifixion would do that. Because Deuteronomy 21, verse 23 states that anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. That's what Caiaphas and the others were seeking, a shameful death that would discredit Jesus. And a judgment from Pilate would secure that. Well, that was their plan. But John saw the hand of God in all of this and the fulfillment of Jesus' words which he spoke, John says, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. The, the saying that John is referring to is probably John chapter 12, verse 32. Jesus said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. His being lifted up would be fulfilled on a Roman cross. That's what Jesus prophesied, and Caiaphas' determination to have him crucified fulfilled the divine purpose. His motive was one of malice, but by means of this injustice, and he and the others unwittingly, unwillingly fulfilled prophecy and carried out the will of God. God is sovereign. He uses even his enemies to praise him. So it's true. Man proposes, God disposes. But they could do that. They could not do that, I should say, on the charge of blasphemy. And so according to Luke 
23, verse 2, they accused him of being a threat to Rome and to Caesar because he claimed to be a king. Hearing that, Pilate decided to investigate the charge more fully. He had Jesus brought into the praetorium and interrogated him and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? The, the question is worded in such a way that, that the pronoun you is in the emphatic position. You are the king of the Jews, which suggests, is, suggests both uh, surprise and disbelief. F from the charge that had been made, Pilate expected a, a belligerent, proud revolutionary. But there was nothing of that in Jesus' appearance or in his bearing. Just the opposite. Christ stood before the judge, the governor, in, in simple clothing, that of a peasant. He was in chains. He'd been beaten. But he stood there with great majesty. Pilate could see from all of this that there was nothing to the charge that was brought against him. But the question had been put to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And it was a question that could not be, be answered, could not be responded to with a simple yes or no answer. Had he asked this out of a sincere interest in knowing about him, or was Pilate simply addressing him according to what had been told him and what he was told to say? Because if the question was merely repeating the charge that the Sanhedrin had rendered, then the answer to that was no, because he was not a political threat. But if he was really seeking to know for his own understanding, then the answer is yes. But Jesus would need to explain the kind of king that he is. So, Jesus responded... Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate responded with uh, an indignant, I'm not a Jew, am I? In other words, he was a Roman. He cared about matters of state and administration, not Jewish religious questions. The only reason they were talking as he explains, was because your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. Still, he wasn't satisfied with the charge they brought against Jesus. He, he felt there must be more to it, that uh, Jesus had done something to provoke their hatred. So he asked, what have you done? Now, Jesus could have told Pilate of his miracles, about his teaching, how he corrected the leaders and provoked them to jealousy. He could have told them many things, but he didn't. Instead, he responded to the charge against him that he claimed to be a king. He is a king, but to explain the kind of king he is, he first defined his kingdom. My kingdom, he said, is not of this world meaning it did not have its origin in this world. It, it's, it isn't governed by the principles of this world, kingdoms that preserve themselves by force. His kingdom is different. He proved that in the garden when Peter tried to defend him with violence and he stopped him and told him to put away his sword. His kingdom is not political power, in the sense that Pilate thought of kingdoms. It's not of this world. Now that doesn't mean that it has nothing to do with this world or that it won't be in this world materially. Revelation 19 gives the vision of him returning on a war horse with a sword, his eyes a flame of fire. But in the present time, He's gathering the citizens of his kingdom by his grace and governing them in peace in the midst of the kingdoms of this world. 
His kingdom is different. Napoleon is reported to have seen the difference and said, I have founded an empire by force and it has melted away. Jesus Christ established his kingdom by love and it stands to this day and will stand. He is a king, but also the prince of peace, whose purpose was not to spread violence and topple governments, but to save his people and reveal truth. That's what he said in verse 37. Pilate said, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Jesus Christ is not only a king, he is the king of kings. And the kind of king he is, the kind of person he is, is indicated in his statement that he was born and he came. He was born of a woman, as we all are. He entered the world naturally. He was a real man with a true body and a reasonable soul. But he also came into the world, which is to say he was sent. And that indicates an existence prior to his entering the world. It speaks of his heavenly origin, his eternal existence with the Father. All that is, is set forth at the very beginning of this gospel in the first five verses. He is both God and man, born of a woman, but conceived by the Holy Spirit. And because he is, he's able to reveal God to man. That's what he came to do, to testify to the truth. The truth about himself as God's son, the truth about salvation that is only in him, and the truth about the judgment to come. And that's the nature of his kingdom. It's the kingdom of truth. And the subjects of his kingdom are those who love truth. Everyone who is of the truth, he said, hears my voice. That's how his influence spreads throughout the world, through his voice which is heard in the proclamation of the gospel. Now that's how his influence spreads throughout the world. Different from other religions, Mohammed spread his religion by the sword. People could convert or die. Christ gathers his, his citizens by his grace and the effective power of his word, the gospel, scripture, which is God's word. Everyone who is of the truth, he told Pilate, hears my voice. And in that, there was perhaps an invitation to Pilate to hear him, to believe in him, to follow him, who is the way, the truth, and the life. But Pilate was a skeptic, and dismissed it with, what is truth? Words that would haunt him for eternity. But maybe the conversation was making him uneasy. So he ended it. And with that, he turned away from Christ the King and returned to the priests and Pharisees outside the praetorium. He knew Jesus was no threat to Caesar, and he said to them, I find no fault in him. Now, at this point, Pilate should have dismissed the case. He'd rendered his verdict of innocence. There was nothing to their charge. He acknowledged that, stated that. And so Jesus should have been released. He knew, though, that Jewish leaders were displeased, and he didn't want to provoke them. Nor did he want to condemn an innocent man. So Pilate, at this point, is on the horns of a dilemma. And by now, a crowd had gathered. And then he remembered 
that they had a tradition and thought that might be the card that he could play that would deliver him. So he reminded them of it, verse 39. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish that I release for you the king of the Jews? It was a choice between the very best and the very worst. A man named Barabbas. He thought he could win sympathy for Jesus by calling him their king. He misjudged the crowd. They supported the priests and they cried out, not this man but Barabbas. Barabbas means son of the father. So some have taken that to indicate that he was the son of a rabbi. Maybe, but if so, he was one of those wild preacher kids because, as John adds, now Barabbas was a robber. According to Mark, he was more than that. He was an insurrectionist, a revolutionary, and a murderer. He was a zealot, and uh, not the kind of man that the Sadducees, Sadducees supported. In fact, he was the very kind of man that they feared. But again, the, the, the irony in this is obvious. The priests persuaded the people to seek the release of a man who was guilty of the very crime that they falsely accused the Lord of committing. As a result, Barabbas would go free and Jesus would die. A great injustice, the greatest injustice. It's the, the death of the just for the unjust, which exposes all the more the, the sin that was behind it. What had Jesus done that the priests and the crowd would prefer Barabbas, a thief and a killer, over him? He'd never stolen from them. He'd never taken money from them. He did nothing out of selfish motive. He lived at the poverty level. He'd never killed them or urged revolt, just the opposite. He preached peace. He'd healed their sick. He'd raised the dead. He went about, as, as Peter put it in Acts 10, doing good. That's a great summary of the Lord's life. He did good in every way. He never did anything that would bring disgrace upon him or others. Never told lies, only truth, and revealed to them the glory of God the Father. In him they had seen only goodness. In him they had seen what John had seen and the apostles, grace and truth. I mean, that's the problem. Because grace and truth are a witness against sin. A witness that produces shame. And that is what they hated him for. He exposed their fallen condition. Men love the darkness rather than the light. So they chose a man like themselves. They chose a man that was like them over one who is like God, who in fact is the God-man. And Pilate went along with it. He knew Jesus was innocent. He knew what justice required. But he failed to do it. What began as a routine day and another trial that he expected to deal with and dismiss quickly became a crisis. A storm that he could not control. And none of us is adequate for the challenges that come unexpectedly in life. That may come later today, that may come tomorrow. Only Christ is adequate for that. He proved that in his trial with his calm control of everything. He's always prepared. He's perfect and powerful. And He is what will make us adequate for the unexpected events of life. Events that we can't foresee or plan for. His life within us and our close relationship with Him. 
That's what's necessary. And it is as we grow in that relationship, which we only do through the knowledge of His Word and the fellowship with the saints, only through that and the obedience that we show to His Word, then we become increasingly adequate and prepared for the unseen. There our relationship grows and we become more and more like Him, more and more with His mind and His understanding. Of course, <clears throat> Pilate had none of that. And so he was completely unprepared and unequipped for what happened. These priests were powerful, clever, and determined men who steamrolled over him. But if there was one other person who awoke that day to what he least expected, more even than Pilate did, it was Barabbas. When he woke up, he was fully expecting to spend the day on a cross. When he heard the crowd shouting his name, he must have thought the mob was calling for his head, eager for his death. Then the jail door opened and the Roman guard said, you're free. He must have sat there stunned, unable to take it in. Perhaps he even followed the crowd to Golgotha and watched the nails go into Christ's hands that he knew should have gone into his. The Son of God died in the place of the Son of the Father, whose father is Adam, who passed on his sin to Barabbas and to all of us. We don't know what happened to him, what his response was, but we know what happened to us. And the experience of Barabbas gives us a picture of the, the grace and of what Christ did for his people, for each of us when he died in our place, the just for the unjust. Barabbas is a picture of us all. We're sinners. We're lawbreakers. The wages of sin is death. We all deserve that. But Christ took our place on the cross in judgment so that we would go free. Pilate asked, what is truth? When the truth was standing right in front of him. He turned away from it. What that showed is Jesus wasn't only the only one on trial. As James Boyce put it, it proved that Pilate himself was on trial and proved himself to be guilty. The most important moment in his life came unexpectedly. Did for Saul of Tarsus as well on the Damascus Road. But he saw Jesus in a blinding light and he believed. He called him Lord. Maybe there's a, someone here, a visitor. You've been to church before, but not heard this about Jesus, that he is king. He is the son of God who died for sinners and there is salvation in him and only in him. What are you going to do with Christ? Or someone who's been here all along, but suddenly you are seeing Christ in, in a way that you haven't seen Him before. What are you going to do? Don't turn away from Him. Don't delay. Know that He is innocent, perfect, and you are guilty. And because He is innocent, and because He is both God and man, He is the solution to your guilt. He was able to take it all onto himself and be punished for the sins of others, for the sins of all who believe in him. He's done that. It's finished. That's what he declared. There's nothing more for you to do but receive what he's done and to do that through faith and faith alone. So turn to Christ. Trust in him. He receives all who do. He equips you for life 
and more importantly, makes you fit for eternity. Listen, we're all fit for eternity one way or another. Without Christ, fit for an eternity of darkness, an eternity of hell. Christ's the solution who fits us for heaven and for the world to come. May God help you to come to Him and trust in Him. And help all of us to live as lights in this world, representatives of Christ. Well, let's stand and sing number 13 in the Songs of Praise book, Wonderful, Merciful Savior, and then remain standing for the benediction. Father, your great servant Augustine wrote that you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. And that is so true. And we thank you that we who were separated from you and in that condition would slip into an eternity of darkness, an eternity of death, of hell. You sent your son to redeem us so that we would find rest in you. And we have done that through faith and faith alone. We thank you for your goodness and your grace that's brought us to an understanding of our lost condition and brought us into your family through the sacrifice of your son, the shed blood of the God-man. Thank you for that work, Father. May we live as lights in a dark world. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.